Hi there everyone. Once again we are with Louisiane here at the Royal Society. She's been working on a special project. We're going to tell you about that later. But first, relating to that, we're going to show you a bounty of papers and bits and pieces and all of them relate to the subject of colour, I'm told. That's right. I've picked some of the items that tell us how colours were made, how people dyed clothes and created different colours, but also how it was used scientifically speaking. And they're all bits that were added to the archive. So like, yeah, we have a word for it, which escapes me right now. An enclosure. There you go. It's an enclosure. When sent with a letter, it's all like little bits and pieces that were added. Like um, an attachment on an email. An attachment on an email, but a physical attachment. Okay. So let's get started. Let's start with the first one. And first of all, because we're talking about color, Brady, are you color blind? That's a question. Let's check. Okay. What we have here is uh, a letter from the 18th century by an engineer, but he's just visiting one of his neighbours who is supposedly colourblind, doesn't see colours. And so he's trying to test what colour he sees, how he sees them. And he attaches how he's conducting the experiment here okay. using that swatch of paper. So today we have regularised tests, but this is what he's using. So what colours do you see, Brady? Hmm, I see like an olivey green and then an orangey yellowiness a very pale pink, again a kind of yellowy orange, and then the first olive again. Amazing. The gentleman, the neighbour, yeah. could only distinguish between the stripes so he could see the white and the black, but after that he misinterprets all of the colours. So he's saying, well, this is definitely what you call yellow, talking about the green. Um, yeah. So he's not distinguishing the colour properly. Did you that. pass? Did you, did you see? I did. I, see, I saw exactly the same colour as you. Okay. I saw olive green. Very good. How did you go, James? Yeah, absolutely yeah. perfect. You passed? <laughs> I should hope so, seeing you're the camera guy. <laughs> All right, very cool. Is this guy, is he like a professional eyesight kind of guy or is this just some amateur in his back room with his mates saying, oh look, I made this test for my mate? He's both a professional, but not in that. He's actually an engineer, so and he makes a lot of money actually with patenting some inventions. He's just sending a letter to a, a quite a famous scientist, quite a famous fellow, Joseph Priestley. Priestley of oxygen fame. Yes, okay. that's right. And we see here it was London, January 15, 1777. Exactly. We have a series of paper all about dyeing and making colours, and a lot of them are actually put together by Robert Hooke, and I've picked one of the ones which I find absolutely amazing that relates to dyeing and making colours and has a, a lot of recipes. A lot of them are in French, some of them are in English. Oh, we need a French speaker. Exactly. Do you well, know? <laughs> I know one. <laughs> oh, I'm taking the gloves off now because we don't handle delicate paper and white gloves. This is just for show. Exactly. What we're looking at here is the beginning of a letter or a group of recipes that Robert Hooke puts together. And you can see he's using alchemical symbols to actually signify some of the recipe elements. So you have water, water. you have tin, yeah. tartar, saltpeter, you have alum, logwood, which comes back again and again, vitriol, distilled, so that's just how to distill things. You have distilled vinegar with the added dot, but very important for color making. Urine. Wow, and it's got its own special symbol. That should be the symbol we put on toilets and things. Exactly. <laughs> They're just a square and a dot in the middle. Okay. So these are all of the elements that come back through the different recipes. and But a lot of added stuff makes it. Oh, horse piss. Well, there you go. That's one type of urine that you can does use. Does that really say horse piss? Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. So the urine actually provides like the fixating agent yeah. as well as cleaning. So you use a lot of urine when you're making money, when you're actually doing the colours. All of that uses urine. So urine is a really important source of um, chemistry okay. in the 17th century. All right. There you go, a little bit of arsenic, just to add a little bit of colour. Yeah. So these are just all the recipes for different colours. If you want to make orange, use, you know... A little bit more tin, a little bit more saffron, a, bit of horse a pinch piss. of this. Little Always the horse piss, that's the basics. Always the horse piss. Yeah. Okay, right. Always. <laughs> right. But what I want, wanted to show you as part of this one is... There you go. So this is again a preparation to make a colour. You're just trying to make very, very specific colours and nuances. So you can see it here. So you have your overall recipe here with nice the different al alchemical symbols. I see the symbols again that we saw at the start. Yeah. So exactly. These are your ingredients. At the end, they're also saying that you can use a bit of chameleon skin to actually refine whichever colour they're trying to make. 
They're saying it's a volatile color. I can't tell it is whether it is because the chameleon is just never the same color mm. or whether because the ingredient is volatile. But there you go, the volatile chameleon color. And this is a little bit of it. They're actually showing you a sample of the color they've managed to make with your chameleon and some cochineal as well. So they're mixing all of these insects all of these mammals just to make a brown color that doesn't look any attractive in any way. It's just tinting a piece of fabric. But the next item that I've chosen is very bright. Okay. And that this is a claim that actually the person who sends it makes that this color is going to remain intact for a very long time. Wow. This is a piece of silk. And the person who sends the piece of silk is, is a, a silk a dye specialist from France. It's a specialty in France around the Lyon region in particular to dye silk in different colors. And the paper that accompanies this explains that he's come up with a brand new way of making pink. And here's the paper. Very flourishing start with an exclamation point, yeah. monsieur. The letter is sent in the 1790s and actually pink is quite a new color. It's a new fashionable color. He's claiming that his pink is pinker and also that it's going to last longer. If you look at any portraits from the uh, 18th century, pink is really pale. It's usually a male color. It's considered to be a strong, warm color. So it's associated with masculinity rather than femininity, actually. But he's saying that this is going to become the latest fashion. And he doesn't want to really reveal the secret to the fellows. He says, if you want to know more, maybe elect me, maybe you know, invite me to come over and I will tell you. So his secret remains safe. He doesn't actually share us the recipe, but it's really pink still. It's lasted it's well. It's lasted really, really well. And I find it really impressive. So his like black male, or, sh or should I say his pink male to try and get elected to the Royal Society didn't work. He didn't... It did not no, work, okay. no. Okay. No. Well, there's the pink. What color we got next? We have all of the colors of the rainbow. We have a spectrum of colors and we have colors being used in a different way. This time it's not for textile, it's to create early photography. Ooh. In Roman times, it was actually more expensive than gold. It is made out of a very innocuous seashell. This is a purpura. I didn't mean to, but it's in French again. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. Yeah. So this paper is about this tiny shell there and you have the shell and its composition here. So it's Lacaz Dutier who uh, shows it. What's the shell called, sorry? This is a purpura lapilus. Ooh. Lacaz Dutier here is using a very noble element, a colorful element to actually experiment with early photography. And he's trying to reproduce an existing photograph using this very expensive color. And you can see another one there. Huh. Basically, it's early photocopy. What I quite like is it's become quite pink, but it, was, it would have been much more purple. So the original color when you crush the shell is quite a bright purple, but with time it's just faded and, and become a lot more pink. So the way he's actually making it is following the example of Sir John Herschel, who is a very important 19th century fellow. And Sir John Herschel is not only interested in astronomy, he's also interested in photography. And a couple of months before the photographic process is invented, he uses vegetable dyes to fix an image on a page. The way it works is that you have to cut your paper and then you superimpose the photo that you want to actually have. And with the sun, just with the effect of the sun, you have the transfer of the image on the color. The opposite of a dark room. It is. Yeah. It is the opposite of a dark room. You're actually <laughs> using the, the rays of the sun. And he's showing how he's actually obtaining different colors. And those have faded very, very badly. Hmm. But these were different spectrums of colors where he was showing how the different vegetable juices were creating different colors. And you can see how the blue has lasted longer. As an archivist, does this break your heart to know those colors have faded away and gone, or is that just like? I think it's just the cost of science, meaning they didn't know how to fix it mm. very well. And one of the things that John Herschel is actually experimenting with are the fixing agents. So he's using gold colored oil, but yeah, he didn't have a fixing agent. So I just think it's just, a, it shows that science just needed to go a little bit further yeah, yeah. for him to actually have the spectra. It was kept very well. I, I'd like to think that my predecessors at the Royal Society did not actually uh, contribute to it fading. So wow. again, he's doing several trials with images and these ones are chrysotypes. The word itself is invented by John Herschel or orophotography. Uh, again, he's inventing that word. And chrysotype comes from gold. So chryso, it means 
gold in Greek, and you have oro, which again means gold in Latin. Okay. And he's using gold as the fixating agent on those, but he's using the vegetable juice as the coloring. Uh, it, you can see it's really a reproduction that is just fading a little bit mm. and that it is a superimposition. So if I took the original portraits, they would all be flipped because it's been superimposed. So they're always making pictures from portraits. They're not ever taking pictures of people like it. No, they exactly. They, there, they yeah. can't do that. It yeah. is reproduction. Yeah. So another one of a ship and this one is a cyanotype. So I think you looked at the cyanotypes that Anna Atkins had done with Rupert um, yes. in a previous, uh, previous episode. We have. But these are the first ones, the very first cyanotypes by Sir John Urschel. And now Sir John Urschel also gave us some undeveloped ones. So these ones, there is an image on there. We just don't know what it is. It's just never been developed. And there's this terrible temptation between wanting to know what's on it because it was sent as a test to the fellows if you want to develop it. You can, yeah. but obviously as an archive, we can't do that. So we have an undeveloped type and we just don't know what's on it. What are we going to do about this? Very Surely in this day and age, you must be able to take this to a scientist who can look at what the image is without developing it. I don't know that there would be a process by which they could actually do it. And the risk of them damaging it versus the benefit of maybe seeing a picture for an archivist who will always err on preserving the item and keeping the mystery intact. I want to see it. <laughs> I've picked those as the last ones of the colours because the project that you said um, we were working on is all about reproducing items. Okay, warning, gratuitous promotion of Louisiane's incredible project approaching. The project is called Science in the Making. The what whole idea is to make all of those items available to everyone. No, 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 we want them to have to watch objectivity to see these. No, no, that's not true. You can, so people can look at this, all this stuff online, can they? Yes, so oh. we are launching Science Cinema Making this week and everyone will be able to look at all of these items and many of the ones that you've looked at before on objectivity. It, they won't have the running commentary and the discussions. That's always going to stay here. Yeah, that's special. We will put a link in the description of the video so people can go and look at this stuff. But like, I saw the numbers. There's some incredible number of objects and papers and things you put in there. You haven't done this all on your own, I hope. I haven't. So we have made about a quarter of a million of photographs. So what Sir John Herschel did, we did that over 250,000 times. And in total of distinct archive, it will be about 35,000 that we'll be launching. So when I'm spring cleaning or doing anything at house, clearing out my office or something, I'm always really slow because every time I pick something up, I'm like, oh, this is interesting and I read it. Is that a danger for you guys as well, as you're scanning all these incredible old documents? It is a big danger. When you're cataloging, you're both supposed to read what's in the paper, but not lose too much time because they have to do a certain number per day. Well, if you want to go and have your own virtual objectivity experience, go and check out this project. There'll be a link in the description. You're going to waste a lot of your lifetime looking at all this cool stuff. So it is quite delicate and you can see there's like the, multiple layers. There's m multiple layers for every single one. And uh, the deeper we'll go, the more layers there is. So here you can actually lift the top of the spine and look underneath it. Yeah. So it really is like an autopsy. And it's also meant to cut out in the same way that you would perform the incisions. And the detail, I think, is really amazing. If you think about how much work it would be for the engraver to actually create every single one of those. Yeah. So very, very intricate.